reintroduction program. So it was um, really fun to actually have the opportunity to talk with a rancher in support of, of that program. <laughs> um, so tonight, Dr. Baden is going to present a talk titled Pre Preserving America's Romance with Parks, Wilderness, Wildlands, and Wildlife. Um, as another aside, we were talking this evening, and um, as one of, his, one of his many publications, he actually wrote an intro to this book of uh, John Stoddard's lectures, uh, volume 10 on Yellowstone National Park. He, he found the book while he was actually staying at a Doubletree Hotel in a, in a different part of the, in a different part of the country on, on yet a different journey and um, picked it up and kind of serendip serendipitously came to open it to a whole uh, section on Yellowstone National Park and later wrote a foreword. So he'll talk a lot this evening about Yellowstone and um, I'm excited to have an economic anthropologist in our midst. I don't think I've ever met one until this evening. So there are many of us. Thank <laughs> you. Welcome, Dr. Chad. Thank you. Thank you. It is really a treat to be here, and the drive over from Bozeman was absolutely delightful. I mean, I don't know what a better world would be than the one we have now. Uh, I mean, I really, I really feel fortunate. And I have also good thoughts about Missoula, and I'm going to spend just a couple minutes uh, sharing my early Missoula experiences with you. Back in the 1960s, um, I worked with a guy by the name of Cecil Garland, who ran Garland's Town and Country in Lincoln. And he was the head, the leader, the instigator, of the Lincoln Backcountry uh, Preservation Group. And it was fighting a sort of uh, early version of crony capitalism, where Anaconda Forest Products, which at that time was based in Missoula, and the uh, Forest Service, uh, Vern Hamry was the superintendent of the Helena, they had, pl they had plotted to, uh, and planned to log the, uh, the Lincoln backcountry, and Cecil's mission was to keep that from happening. Thank you so much. 
Oh, turn this on. Yes, thank you. I am, I am challenged electronically. I can run almost anything with a diesel engine, but uh, I'm not very good with electronics. So, can you hear me now? Okay. So at any rate, so I ran across Cecil, and we worked together on that, and spent a lot of time in Missoula. And then, uh, a fellow by the name of Pete Geddes, who was a graduate student in forestry here, he, do you know Pete? Oh my goodness. Pete uh, was, a, was a student here, a, gra a master's student, and he ran across some of my writings. And he talked to one of his professors, uh, who I think I will not know, name just to preserve him. Uh, it was a, he taught forest economics, and he assured Pete that those guys in Bozeman were just nuts. Uh, they were just whacked out classical liberal slash libertarian economists, and he should just stay away from them. Well, he came over, and we met, and he worked for me, with me, for about 14 years. So that, that was good. And he now runs, is the general director of something uh, called the American Prairie Reserve, which I think we'll come to later. Three and a half, 3.2 million acre project in northeastern Montana. Uh, and then there's another guy uh, who was here, Don Snow, who taught uh, environmental literature. Anyone know Don Snow? He taught, he taught environmental literature. Uh, and he, uh, we, he was one of the founders, with my wife and myself, of Gallatin Writers. And he was here for a long time and loved Missoula. Uh, but the university didn't love him as much as he loved, it, uh, loved being here. And so he moved to uh, uh, Whitman College where he became the Mellon professor, uh, which is quite a, quite a good move, I suppose. So at any rate, I have these really good thoughts about, and memories coming into Missoula. So I really am grateful for the opportunity to, to come back. Well, I'm gonna talk today about the Yellowstone Park as an experiment from which we can learn a great deal. Now, my wife and I live in a place that's only uh, roughly an hour north of the park, uh, up the down the Gallatin, and uh, we live just outside of Gallatin Gateway. And so we spend a lot of time in the park, and we had a couple projects involving the park. And I think that Yellowstone was a glorious, glorious experiment. And we are so right, the world's, which I'm sure you all know, it was the world's first national park, uh, founded, established in 1872. And uh, it was an experiment that we should relish, that we should cherish, and we should recognize as an experiment. It was not given to us on stone tablets. But rather, it was just an idea. It was a wonderful idea. Let's preserve this great space. And we don't know what we're going to do with it, but let's preserve it. So for a while, they didn't do anything with it at all. Uh, they just sort of left it. And it was, a, it was preserved due to the fact it was so remote and America was so lightly populated. And so there just wasn't much of an impact but of course, if it's an open access commons, it will become exploited when people recognize the values there for exploitation and they, and they have the means to exploit them. And as a result, of course, there was a great deal of poaching. Some, some years, apparently, there were thousands of elk that were slaughtered in the park. There was the poaching of bison, and people were knocking off geological specimens and so forth. Petrified wood was something that was, was easy to take, and uh, as a result, it was just exploited. So for the first few years, the only thing that saved it was being remote and, and the fact that America was so lightly populated. This was a period 
America in the post-Civil War period, by today's standards, was a fairly grim place. And let me, ah, yes. There was, a, there was a great deal of corruption, there was a great deal of collusion among politicians and strong political interests. And as a result of that, of course, there was a reaction to it. And so the progressive movement emerged, and I'm sure that, that you would recognize Gifford Pinchot, Teddy Roosevelt, and, and others of, the, of that era. And they basically identified really serious problems and set about to try to come up with alternative arrangements to deal with the problems, of course. But America at that time, we should understand, was by today's standards, at best, an emerging third world country. Where well, population was only about 42 million in the post-Civil War period, immediately after the Civil War. Life expectancy in 1900 was 42 years for men, slightly more for, uh, this is white, white men, slightly more for white women, 42 years. I, I mean, that's really, our, their income was roughly, it's hard to measure that, but not more than 5%, 1 20th what it is today. I mean, it was a, it was a poor place by today's standards. By those standards, it was this. It was doing quite well, as a matter of fact. But people who are poor do not place ecological integrity on a very high plane in terms of the things that they want to achieve and they want to preserve. And so there was all manner of terrible stuff going on in terms of market hunting for game, all manner of, of what we would now consider horrible ways to harvest stuff for markets. And basically, there were just lots and lots of problems. A lot of them came, by the way, from having poorly enforced, poorly defined property rights that gets, gets fixed a bit as they go forward. But the point is that the progressive people r rose up against the robber barons and came up with a number of institutions to try to repair or preclude some of those problems. And among them, I think that Yellowstone Park is among the very, very, very highest. Um, so what they did then, after the first few years, was bring in the US Army to manage the park. How many of you knew that the military ran, the Army ran? Oh, you all did. Wow. <laughs> That's really unusual. I gave a, a, a talk on a related topic at Duke University, and I, I think that in a crowd a bit bigger than this, only about three people knew that. So congratulations to, uh, to, to you. So at any rate, so the military came in, and they basically protected it from poachers, of various sorts. They did a b whole bunch of constructive things as well, of other constructive things. They laid out the road system. They built a power plant. They laid out, there's no, we're still back in, uh, that period. There's, there's the army. Oh, there's some, uh, some soldiers who captured some uh, bison head from poachers. After the bison were nearly wiped out, back the, uh, the heads were then sold for hanging on walls for $500. Uh, so it's worth poaching them. So how many of you have been to Mammoth? Everybody, <laughs> good Lord. This is so different than Duke University. I mean, it really is. I should retrain my mind and, and realize that this is your backyard too, isn't it? Okay. Okay, there it is. There's Mammoth. It's a military base. Of course it is. It's, it's, <laughs> think about that if you, if you would uh, the, next, the next time you visit. Well, 
Natalie mentioned, I guess she, the book, did you, you still have the book? Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yellowstone was an exotic place. It was so exotic that there were people such as this guy, John Stoddard, uh, who was a professional lecturer. And he, uh, born in 1859, graduate of Williams College, then went to Yale Divinity School. And when he finished his education, he decided to make his living as a, basically, a professional tourist commentator and lecturer. So he would go to exotic places, Salon, Egypt, just a whole variety of, of places that were truly exotic. And then he would come back to the United States and lecture about them. And in the 1890s, he toured Yellowstone Park. And I was lecturing at Duke and staying in the Doubletree Hotel, and they have a little library. And I randomly grabbed a book off the library shelf and opened it up, and I randomly opened it up to John's, volume 16 of John Stoddard's lectures, and it was the section, 94 pages on Yellowstone Park, which is really marvelous. And one of the things that I find intriguing about it is, and I might actually have the, the actual quote here, I, but it doesn't matter much, because I will get it basically right. He said, anyone who's toured the park well, it's certainly understand that it's essential that the U.S. Army run it, that the U.S. Army manage the park. And he went through the various reasons why the park needed to be protected. And the reasons, of course, all made sense. And he went on at some length about how terrible it was that the Army was underfunded in its management of the park that the road system should be the envy of the world. It should be as good as the roads in Germany. And, and, and on and on. He didn't, he didn't overstress it, but he noted that financial pressures were really serious and they should be corrected. We're going to see that movie again. Uh, I assure you of, of that. And that's where I'm gonna, going to end this, uh, this, this discussion until we just have it exchanged. Well, the Park Service was created, as I'm sure you know, in 1916. So we're celebrating its centennial. And as the Army back then, the Park Service today, seems to be woefully underfunded. There's a, what the Park Service, the uh, GAO, Government Accounting Office, reports that unfunded Repairs and maintenance in the parks are $12 trillion. Now, I'm sure that figure is not right because the managers of the, of the various park units all have incentives to exaggerate the amount it would take. That's, that's one thing for sure, to get it ship shape. And the other, the other thing is that they're taking these numbers on a, under the presumption that the federal government will do the work, well, contract the work. So you know there are going to be cost overruns. And it's, it's, so that figure is, is very, sounds very high. A realistic figure would probably be much less than that if it were not done by the federal government, which I, would, I hope we move in that direction. We probably will move in that direction. Um, one of the problems is with, that's inherent to the structure of the Park Service is that there are strong political incentives to keep adding units to the park and the monument system. Uh, I think it was last year they added 10 units. They're 400 now. I could be off on that a little bit. But the fact that they would add any when, the, when they can't afford to keep up what they have seems pathological, but it's the logical, it's the logical consequence of having it organized and run and funded politically. I mean, that of course will happen. How many steam train uh, monuments do we have in the United States? I don't know, it's four or five, maybe six. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I love steam trains, so don't get me wrong on that. But the, 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 <laughs> the structure leads to perverse consequences. Uh, and, and the Park Service, of course, because it's a federal agency, 
it spends a huge amount more than a, a private not-for-profit or for-profit firm would spend doing the same thing. Did anybody recognize the name of Randall O'Toole? Randall O'Toole, in my judgment, is probably the, the most interesting and one of the very best natural resource economists in America. But Randall states, the Park Service spends double per square foot on housing uh, compared to private home construction costs and double per, 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 per square foot on visitor centers, again, versus private uh, construction. These are, the, these are predictable consequences of the park being created as a political, as a government-owned federal agency. This is for sure going to happen. This, this, this sort of problem would not surprise anyone who's familiar with public choice economics or Austrian economics. It's just, the, it's just a, the bureaucratic pathology is something that's going to be with us the same way influenza is going to be with us and a common cold is going to be with us. And I suggest that we just try to recognize that. We had, in Yellowstone, let me move to Yellowstone, an area where, that I'm fairly familiar with. Um, we have a couple projects involving it. Yellowstone was to be run in accord with something called, part of the whole progressive era, scientific management. And basically the formula for scientific management was take fine young men of good breeding and character and give them good training and then send them out to manage for the public interest for the long run. Okay, that's, that's the basic model. However, it's really, really, really hard to get it right the first time. And what happens, of course, is that the agency, I'm going to just talk about Yellowstone now, not generalize to other parks at the moment, although there probably are similar things at other parks. In Yellowstone, scientific management said we should do the following. Well, first, let's divide animals into two types. Uh, it's sort of a crude division, but they're good animals and they're bad animals. And the good animals have big brown eyes, and the bad animals have little yellow squinty eyes, and so let's set about to kill the bad animals. And so they, of course, exterminated the wolves. And you know the con I assume you know the consequences of that. That was an explosion, of, eventually, uh, of the elk herd. Another thing was to put out all fires as soon as they occur, within 24 hours, preferably. And by the way, John Stoddard, one of the things that he does is celebrate the Army's success in keeping fires down. And so, so reiterate, putting fires out immediately leads to what? Well, it leads to fuel buildup. And so when you have a fire such as those of 1988, uh, you have, what was it, 42% of the entire park burned. It was a glorious fire, by the way. Uh, my wife and I uh, toured it, and it was, it was a spectacular event. And there were all manner of silly people who claimed the park was destroyed. Uh, and of course, it wasn't destroyed by any means. Uh, the, a lot of important stuff nearly was. And there was a lot of pathology involved with that, by the way. Bureaucratic pathology that precluded uh, some, some highly constructive uh, actions. Uh, so we had to kill, kill, the, kill the animals and uh, put out the fires immediately. Third thing was feed the bears. Oh, this sorry. Still military, military leaving, military patrolling. Ah, yes, killing wolves. One of the things that uh, the, the, the army did was kill the wolves. But the last one, apparently, was killed by the biological survey in the Department of Interior in 1927. Feed the bears. Problem with feeding bears. And when my wife grew up just west of the park, a farm out of Ashton, Idaho. When she was a little girl, they would often go to watch. Her family, would, her parents would drive them to watch feeding the bears. 
And they were dumping hotel garbage out, and the bears, of course, loved it. And I did, any of you recognize the name of Craighead? Craigheads were doing uh, research on the consequences of that, more feeding the bears. And of course, the problem with feeding the bears, I mean, it's, it's fun, I'm sure. But the problem with feeding the bears is that bears, of course, begin to associate people with food, and then they get in trouble, and then, of course, uh, they're dispatched. And there are all manner of clever ways to do that. I mean, you've seen bear traps that the Park Service uses. Can you, you sir, in the middle, in the blue shirt, he's looking around. Yeah. Would, would you describe a uh, Park Service bear trap for us? It's a giant metal barrel. It's a culvert. Yeah. yeah. It's, a it's a steel culvert, and because there's nothing for the bear to grab onto, and they don't get hurt too badly. Uh, but we have a neighbor uh, dead now, had a neighbor, Bill Black by name, uh, whose family ran a whole bunch of sheep in the area which is now a big sky in the Yellowstone Club. And there, according to Bill, there were somewhere between 14 and 20 bands of sheep run there. And he told me, now, can't vouch for this, but I can promise you he told me, that they would capture these bears and haul them up and dump them out where the sheep herders were with their sheep, knowing full well that the sheep herders would, of course, dispatch the grizzlies. Uh, and the black bears as well. So the, the, uh, the lesson from that is a good, uh, <laughs> well, the, the lesson from that is if you feed a bear, that bear will become a dead bear. So the scientific management came in and did three things that were obvious that turned out to be really very, very, very bad policy. But each of these activities develop strong constituencies within the Park Service, within Yellowstone and the Park Service, and in the communities around. I mean, the hotels love to promise their tourists that we'll show, we'll show you, you know, come stay at our place, we'll show you some bears. Uh, and this, it went on and on and on and on. And then, in the 1980s, roughly, and into the 90s, a group of Park Service people in Yellowstone basically said, we have these three problems that are really big problems that we need to address. And so they did. And so now, of course, we have the let burn policy. We don't feed bears. And we reintroduced the wolves in 95. Uh, and we actually, my wife, our little foundation, my wife and I uh, sponsored a, a, produced a poster that some of you may have seen. It's called Yellowstone Homecoming, uh, which we think we put out in 93, but I'm not positive of the year. But before the wolves were introduced, uh, it was clear that that was a good thing to do. But it took a massive amount of work and against huge political opposition to fix these problems of scientific management. Wow, what a victory. And so my major point is that Yellowstone was an experiment. And it was a glorious experiment. And we're extremely lucky that it happened. And, but it has pathologies. And they aren't going to get it perfect. And it's going to get worse. It's going to get much, much worse. And not those specific biological, ecological problems that I, man that I mentioned, but what's going to change substantially is going to be the political economy environment in which, in which the park operates. When lands are owned by the government, they are necessarily political lands. There's, just, there's no getting away from that. And what we're going to have, unless you're a total Pollyanna of some sort, we're going to have huge, huge economic pressures that are going to come down. And they aren't anyone's fault. It's nothing that we can do anything about. But the actuarial, if you, if you look at what's the, what is the deficit of the United States? What's the advertised deficit of the United States at the moment? I don't know. 19 trillion, 20 trillion, something like that. Ballpark. But the actuarial deficit 
is at least five and probably much greater than that. In other words, if you count the promises that we've made in terms of, terms of Social Security and Medicare, just to talk, mention two things where, where I'm the recipient of welfare, um, this is arithmetic. This is demography. This is going to happen. These pressures are going to grow. And what do we know for sure? We know that entitlements trump ecology. There's no question about that. We know that welfare trumps wilderness. There's no question about that. In the political process. Not in my value system, almost surely not in yours, but in the political process, that's the way it's going to work. So that's going on. Demography is given. Demography may not be destiny, but it's a very, very, very powerful, powerful force. And then in addition to that, how many of you, how many of you believe, no, I may, maybe I shouldn't say it that way. Uh, no, I'd say it that way. How many of you believe that global warming is occurring? All right. How many of you believe that if global warming is occurring that the oceans are going to rise? I think there's unanimity on it. Near unanimity on these. Okay. I, li I listened to uh, NPR, National Progressive Radio, nearly all the time. And they've had a number of stories in the last couple of days about oceans rising and the problems that they're posing for something, I don't know, like tw 25 to 35 percent of the population. New Orleans, New York, you know, all these places that I don't especially care for, they're just, they are going to be in bad shape. I'm not opposed to them. I just don't want to go there. I mean, I, you know, getting me to leave Gallatin County is, uh, is sort of, <laughs> I, I consider, well, it's, it's an adventure to come all the way to Missoula, you know. I I, it really is. Uh, but when this occurs and we have trillions of dollars of real estate at risk, and tens of millions of people at risk, and all, oh, I left something out. You guys are so smart that I assume you already knew it, but just in case you happen not to. The funds for Social Security and Medicaid and veterans benefits and all of that sort of thing, that's given by the formula. Congress can change it there would be huge, huge, huge problems in trying to change it. And I can't imagine eliminating them. Uh, but those are basically set. And the rest of the budget, which is an ever smaller proportion of the federal budget, is called discretionary. And it's going like this. Now, if tens of millions of people's lives are threatened by rising oceans and trillions of dollars of real estate are at risk, and that's going to be part of the discretionary budget as well. And that's competing with funds to manage the parks and the monuments and all that stuff. What's going to win? I, I, I don't think you need a degree in political science to answer that question. So problems that will dwarf the problems that scientific management generated earlier, I think, are coming and they're unavoidable, absolutely unavoidable. Um, so what do I propose? Well, as I said, I think that the, the creating, not just, I mean, I picked Yellowstone because it's my backyard and it's the most well-known and so forth. It was a glorious idea, but it was an experiment. And so we created the experiment and just sort of left it and if you recognize the name Gar Garrett Hardin, Tragedy of the Commons, how many are familiar with Tragedy of the Commons? Okay. G when I was a graduate student, I began w working with Garrett Hardin. We did a book that some of you may have heard of called Managing the Commons. It was a fairly well-known book. Uh, the federal budget, by the way, is also a commons. Not only are fisheries a commons, but the federal budget as well, is as well. But we have these problems that are, natural, that are natural occur, uh, naturally occurring, the natural consequence of the organization, of the structure of the organization. 
So first we started it, and it was an unmanaged commons. Okay. So then the Army was set in to manage it, and it was a managed commons. And then the Park Service created in 1916, took over management of the park in 1918, and they had this formula uh, of scientific management, and it generated some problems. But notice, it, it got fixed. I mean, the three I mentioned got fixed, not perfectly, but the elk population is, is down 80%, which is a huge victory. And now, by the way, the next problem there is going to be bison, 5,000 bison rattling around, most of them in the Lamar Valley, and bison are exotic species in the park. They were not there naturally, except in a very, 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 very small number. Uh, and there's no control, unless we bring back the saber-toothed tiger. The wolf came and took care of the problem uh, with the elk. They're down 80 by 80%. And now that's sort of, I think it's, I think biologists generally agree that that's a, about the right number. Uh, but there's, and there's, bison have no predators. And the political opposition uh, for active management is so high, is so large that the Park Service is going nuts, or Yellowstone people, are going nuts trying to manage the bison. Because bison are really, really good at making more bison. And there's no good way to constrain those numbers and keep, that num keep those numbers down because the political opposition is so high. So what do I propose? Okay, we had this great, this great creation. We've had this experiment in managing. And I suggest that the, that the next step is by all means keep it national. By all means keep it public. By all means get it out of the hands of politicians and make it a national trust. And Yellowstone was the first national park. It was an example that's been, re that been replicated all over the world. Its management has been admired and adopted all over the world. And I think if we, did, if we made that change in Yellowstone, it would be noticed all over the world. And the problems that I've mentioned for, for our parks and, the, and our monuments as well are going to be replicated other places as well. So, we had a great experiment, and I suggest that the next phase in that experiment is to recognize that, it, that we're in this evolutionary process, excuse me, and the most, the most ecologically and economically responsible thing we can do is to transfer it, keep it public, keep it federal, but make it a national trust. And there's a huge, huge amount of literature on trust, and we've had something on the order of 450 60 to 500 years of experience in dealing with trust. We're pretty good at it. Okay, I uh, think I've spoken the 45 minutes I was told to speak, and I'm happy to uh, engage in any discussion you want to have, and uh, or I answer any questions you have. Yes, sir. Um, do you, can you explain like what that would look like in you know, Yellowstone, like making a national trust? Mm -hmm. How many? Yes. Uh, how many of you heard of Monticello? Thomas Jefferson, home place. Mount Vernon. Uh, those are national trusts. They are owned not by the government, but they're owned by a trust. A group of trustees who, who have a corporation, a not-for-profit not corporation, that has title to it and has a group of trustees and they basically have a mission, and the mission is, and I don't know the specifics of those missions at all, but there's two examples I thought you would have heard of. Uh, but the trustees have an obligation, a legally enforceable obligation, to fulfill the duties specified uh, in the trust relationship. Yellowstone seems to me is pretty well laid out, and transferring that to trust, I assume, would, I'm, not, I'm not an attorney. I, I, ran seminars for federal judges for 25 years, but I don't have training in the, in the law. I mean, this is not what I know. But there are lots of people who have worked on this for a very long time. I mean, on the trust idea as applied to natural areas. Um, so I, did, I gave you two examples. You may remember what year was it when all the parks were shut down? And the park service was acting sort of like the Gestapo for people who were inside. Well, uh, Mount Vernon didn't shut down. 
Monticello didn't shut down. Ah, oh, but the federal government uh, did close the federal parking lots that were nearby. It's not an accident that I wear a pin that says Liberty on it, by the way, with two stars. The other stars st uh, stand for uh, ecology and prosperity. Any other uh, questions or comments? Yes. Adam. Um, so just to put this in context of what we discussed last week, for example, and I had told you earlier that Terry Anderson came and spoke last week about the idea of basically privatization of public lands, or maybe not going all the way to privatization, but but doing charter, charter lands or charter forests and, and using that model. Um, perhaps you could speak, especially for the students who are kind of working through these different models of, of economic value systems, how the trust is different than, say, what you, you're familiar with, with what Perk is saying with regards to... Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not responsible for what Ted Anderson says. Uh, he, he, he's been in print for advocating and selling Yellowstone. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear that, that my position is rather diametrically opposed to that. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to, to answer as best I understand. I don't quite understand what you are asking me. I guess if you could just, given your experience with these different economic models, speak to, and, and kind of, I guess, a follow-up to Lizzie's question about what is a trust, what does it look like? Um, how it would be different than maybe some of these other models have okay. been Okay, I'm, I'm sure you've all had experiences with trust. Now, I, I'm not by any means an expert on art museums. But I think it's the case that the vast majority of art museums are run as public trusts. And they have a specific mission. And every once in a while they get in the lawsuit, by the way. Uh, because someone says the trustees are violating the mission that was established that established this park. It was a very famous one in the Philadelphia area, but that, 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 that's beside me. The specifics don't matter. Um, but they are public. They are open to the public with constraints, of course. Um, and they're run as not-for-profits. And they are run by a group of elected trustees, and there will be some, there's no perfect system. I am not holding this out as perfection. This too will be an experiment. And I'm simply saying that the trust idea is a logical next step. In the, and I'm only talking about Yellowstone, but I, my hope would be it would be expanded uh, far beyond that. Uh, but again, it would be an experiment. That's be a revocable experiment also. That could be set up when, when that could be part of the deal when it's set up, by the way. And uh, I, I, by the way, this is not a new idea that I'm just launching today. I've been writing this idea for well in excess of 30 years. Uh, and for a long time, it was viewed as just a nutcase idea. And as the dangers become more obvious and the pressures become more severe, it's becoming certainly less radical. Uh, let me just, uh, next week, I think it's next week, or perhaps the week after, we're going down uh, to Yellowstone to meet with the superintendent, Dan Wink. Uh, and a year ago, October, he took a temporary leave as superintendent of Yellowstone Park. And he served as the acting president of the National Park Foundation. And then March, uh, I think March 1, of, of 2015, he went back to his role as superintendent of Yellowstone. So the, the, the people in the agencies, they're sat, the people who rise to the top in those agencies are smart guys. And they understand what's happening and they're exploring these options. I mean, some are committed to a socialist enterprise, the meaning owned by the, the government. Uh, but others are far more pragmatic, sensible, responsible, ethical, and they are really looking at alternative sets of organizations. Remember that decisions are almost always made on, unless you consciously, deliberately randomize them, randomize the results of, the, of a decision, they're made on the basis of information and incentives. And the question is, what kind of information is generated 
by some sort of, of arrangements, and what are the incentives, incentives to act on that? And a bureaucratic political system, I think, is woefully, in general, woefully inappropriate for managing an, an ecosystem where time and place specific variables are huge and are constantly interacting, and making predictions about them is really, really tough. And the people who made those initial mistakes with scientific management in Yellowstone, killing wolves, putting out fires, feeding bears, they were not nasty people, evil people, by any means. They were operating with the best knowledge they had. Now, they were responding, of course, uh, to constituency pressures. There's no question about that. Uh, but it, but it wasn't, a, a, it wasn't a, the mistakes were not a function of corruption. They were not a function of anything other than not understanding what was going on. And we learn, and when we learn, we adopt, and we tr and we should try to arrange the institutions so that we generate, such that they generate good information, good scientific information, and incentives to respond responsibly to that information. Yes, sir. Two, two in the back, blue and then orange. Uh, it might be apples and oranges, but. I do think it's important. Uh, that's about Valles Caldera down in New Mexico was an old ranch that the federal government purchased. Yeah. Then they turned it into a special preserve that was a trust with trustees, and they tried to, that went on about 10, 15 years maybe, but just in the last couple of years, uh, that was driven by, I believe, Senator Domenici really wanted to push that concept, but after 10 or 15 years, if I recall, the whole board unanimously yeah, said we should return this, basically actually put it into the Park Service, and the whole Democrat and Republican delegation of New Mexico also supported it because it just didn't work. Now, I've been to the preserve, it's very, very remote in preference, not like Yellowstone, which is kind of Disneyland-ish, a lot of pre-existing infrastructure and whatnot, but at least, you know, if you comment on some of the lessons learned, because I don't know exactly everything behind it, but I remember thinking, okay, good idea, and then when it didn't work out, I was left scratching my head, like maybe this isn't so good for most places, that maybe Yellowstone is an exception. I, by the way, I'm only, my knowledge uh, of the situation has, you've just increased it by about 50%. I only sort of knew it existed, knew it didn't work, but note, it was reversible. Uh, for, and I don't know why it didn't work, I don't know, I really don't know anything about it other than I was aware it was there, was aware it had problems, and took, took note that they basically gave it up. I, and that's all I can tell you, other than you're right. Uh, I think, you know, trust is a function of your rest, your rest is going to be, it yells on your property and then the revenue that you generate, and again, so many people go to Yellowstone, that wouldn't really change. So I think there, it's just they didn't have enough funds to develop it out and pay for what they felt would better serve the process. So they felt the government would be a more reliable source of funds versus just the, having the property itself. I, my bet is they were correct, uh, but I don't know enough to, to make a responsible comment other than to say what I've already said. And so would you say then that for those places that maybe couldn't be, let's just say, let's assume it's self, it was a self-sufficiency question as far as just balancing your budget, that those, what you do with them then, so you try it out, then what happens? Well, the, you know, one question, oh, I'm sorry. That then it's gonna end up just being auctioned off and turned into private hands. I know you've stated that you don't want to, I'm saying, other people out there that would use that as an opportunity, let's say the trust didn't work out, it is reversible, like you said, but wouldn't there be a risk then that it would just kind of become a slippery slope and end up in places that no one ever intended? I would think that when the transfer is made, that that would be precluded. We put our ranch in a conservation easement, for example, and we can't do anything about that. Um, but we, oh, what we know for sure is we can't develop it, and so. I, mean, I I don't know if that's that may even uh, be. Let me, let me uh, move to the gentleman on your right, and then I'll move down here. Uh, 
I, I, I guess I don't understand why you think that a Yellowstone Trust would be any less susceptible to political and economic pressures than is a Yellowstone National Park. Oh, okay. Yellowstone Park was under great pressure, well, no, internal pressure in this case, to kill all the wolves. I'm just going to pick that example. And the consequences of that were really horrendous. I mean, I don't know what the numbers were on elk, but we know that there were, there were at least three National Academy of Sciences studies of what the numbers should be. And if I remember, the low was like 3,700 and the high was something shy of 9,000. But the numbers of elk got up to 40,000. And there was a huge amount of political pressure to A, keep those elk high, and then there was also a great deal of pressure to keep, to not reintroduce the elk. I'm sorry, the, excuse me, the wolves. And that was, the political pressures there were just huge. And it took an immense amount of time and effort and courage and political maneuvering to get the wolves in. If that were a trust, they would basically do it. I, I mean, they, they had to, they could salt with, the biological science, science scientists, they would have some on staff, of course. They say, look, our elk are way, way, way out of hand. Uh, we need a way to control them. We can't, and you could, I assume it set it, we could probably set up, we'll not have allow hunting in the park. Uh, so we aren't going to have normal hunting. And so let's put the wolves in. And not, my bet is they would do it. I mean, it's, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 not, I'm not ignoring you, I'm just having trouble hearing you. I'm just saying you're assuming that the trust could be insulated from political pressure or economic pressures, and, they, and you can't do that. What, why can you not do that? We have, we've had five, 450 plus years of experience with trust resisting pressures. Not, not trust running public lands. Maybe trust running things that were never, that, that never had that kind of public attention, public concern political constituencies, et cetera, et cetera. I, don't, I really don't know what the history is of trust running basically wildlands, and that's what we're talking about. I know it exists for sure in America. I don't, I don't have a, a catalog of that. And the British lands, part what would be national parks here, I believe are run by the British National Trust. Not that that's a good model. I mean, that's, you know, the Great Britain's, a, you know, a, a tiny little place compared to, to America. But there's a lot of experience worldwide with trusts and not-for-profits running chunks of land. And resisting pressure is something that trusts are, are, are pretty good at. That's why they were created, in part, to resist political pressures. Yes, sir. Oh, wait a minute. I'm just going to take this gentleman, and then we'll come over to you. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't have any specific knowledge of um, John Stoddard's argument yeah. of why, why the Army should um, run. This was in the 1890s, remember, not, not recently. But I imagine a significant <laughs> part of that might be because of, uh, you know, the massive amount of poaching uh, and other resource uh, violations. Um, in, to protect against that. And yeah. so I think that is, continues to be a significant part, um, not just the resource protection, but also um, emergency management, whether it's uh, fire management or law enforcement or emergency medical services, search and rescue. That's a huge part of what the National Park Service does now, especially in a big park like Yellowstone. And my concern um, is that I think one of the reasons that those um, that the National Park Service is functional with that is because it's a public agency um, with you know those set up standards for for doing that. And my concern would be that that could easily fall by the wayside in a new system. And my basis for that is the Golden Gate National Recreation Area um, in San Francisco, the, the Presidio, yeah. um, is almost exclusively managed by the Presidio Trust now. 
um, they occupy the whole top floor of the National Park headquarter there. Um, and there's a big, uh, there's a, a contentious dynamic in some ways between the National Park Service and the Trust because the Trust has uh, sort of local money that allows it to, to operate and run the park. But there are certain things like the emergency management aspect, which is significant in San Francisco, um, that the trust just wouldn't wouldn't be able to do without the park service. And yet the park service is uh, strangled by the, the trust in, in, in some well, I know nothing about the details there, but we do have an experiment going on from which we're learning for sure. So, but do you think that a trust, or in what way could a trust, um, you know, still maintain that, that resource protection and, and just greater protection um, function of a national Trusts are really good at, at, at generating money. Uh, we, I mentioned earlier uh, American Prairie Reserve. This was uh, created, gosh, not very many years ago. And the goal there is to have 3.2 million acres, which is roughly 50% bigger than Yellowstone. And they put together a hodgepodge of, of ownership. Uh, they're trying to reintroduce the, what well, they have reintroduced, the bison. Uh, they're looking for the wolf and the grizzly to come back, with, which are plains animals. And um, it's totally private money. They don't take any government money. They don't take any money obtained by force or by fraud, which means they don't take government money, uh, since nearly all of that is obtained by force or by fraud. So, look, there are all these experiments going on. And what I'm saying is the system we have is going to face Huge, huge pressures. Uh, by the way, does any, you guys know so much, maybe one of you will know this. How many members are there in the Chinese Amateur Photography Club? Does anyone happen to know that? No, the number of, of, of Chinese who are members of the Chinese Amateur Photography Guild or whatever they call it. If any of you ever find that out, I'd, I'd be delighted to know. And anyway, how, whatever that number is, and the number that was floated by me was 12 million. I have no idea if that's correct. That the number one destination for, the, for that club outside of China is Yellowstone Park. Wow. <laughs> and culture makes a huge difference. I've spoken a good bit with people managing, our, managing Yellowstone now. And the problems that they have with people who come in from cultures that are not ours sometimes are horrendous. Uh, that's going to be a huge, huge, huge problem. I don't know what's going to. I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea. But I know we're running an experiment, and we, it was a glorious thing that we started. And we and we. I really want to preserve that. And the experiment we have going on now with this very big chunk of ground, 3.2 million acres in a place up in. <laughs> Northeast Montana. How many of you visit North, Northeast who do not live there or have relatives there? How many of you visit Northeast Montana? Ooh, why? <laughs> the ah, okay, good, a good re national wildlife refuge. Anyone else? I mean, it's a place. Look. It's not an accident. It was the last place homesteaded and had the least successful homesteading rate of, of any place in the continental United States, roughly 18%. But yet that place has been taken over to be recreated as a wildlife area that is integrated with ranching. It's really quite amazing. And that's an experiment. I think what a glorious experiment. I'm biased, of course. One of my students was a founder, and one of my associate for almost 15 years is a general director. Uh, but I'm not close to it, I mean, other than through those contacts. But we have all these experiments going on. Let's learn from them, because a crunch is coming. There is absolutely no doubt about that. So what can we do that's ethically, ecologically responsible in anticipation? I had the sense there was at least one or two hands up. Yes, sir. 
uh, going back to a previous point, the, uh, the issue of what would threaten the trust. And right now we have individuals in small communities who feel like the federal government has taken their land and they want control of that back. It's a fairly large movement right now. And uh, that could, as long as that trust remains federal land, they would probably still want to get some of that back, get control of that back. And of course, one way would be to get on the, uh, get on the board. But uh, just, it's just a way that that trust could be threatened just like national forests are or wilderness areas are. Okay. Uh, I, I understand that, that objection. I, I, I would give it relatively little weight. I mean, I, I mean, look, trustees tend to be very jealous of their prerogatives. And getting on the board of a board of a trust of that sort, people who would be, who would be nominated for the board or volunteer for the board, we scrutinize very, very carefully. And I would be astounded if that were to be a, a, a serious problem. I could be wrong. Uh, I could be wrong. Again, when the trust is established, there are going to be constraints on what can happen to it, for sure. Like, it can never be sold on the market. I think that would be a good thing, of course. Uh, by, by the way, let me, I don't think I gave this enough emphasis. The political process is such that we keep generating more and more parks and monuments, even though we can't afford to take care of those we have now. Uh, and it, it doesn't matter what the administration is. It, it just, the local pressures are such that that just happens and that dilutes. There's some of these uh, monuments uh, that the, the visit, per visitor cost to the Park Service is in excess of $500 per visitor. It, I mean, it's, it's nuts, except it's politically quite rational for, the, you know, for, for those who manage to get it in place. Uh, and that, 500 is sort of an, is an outlier, that, that's an extreme case, but a huge number of them are, have extraordinarily high costs per visitor. You know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 200 bucks is not uncommon. Because the administrative costs are just high. I mean, it's like, and very few people care about them. There are far too many parks and, and monuments than we should have. I mean, that's basically where we go. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I don't know where to start. Uh, you just made a categorical statement that there are far too many parks and monuments. The American people obviously do not agree with you because the American people, through their elected officials, are the ones responsible for the creation of those 400 national parks and monuments. They celebrate our national culture, our natural heritage, our cultural heritage. They celebrate us as a people of the United States of America. This is why we came to this country. These are the things, these are the places we hold dear. And you have made no case that a trust, this delusional myth that you've come up with would be any better. You talk about scientific principles from wildlife management, and yet you're talking about things that happened in 1918, 1916, but you're looking at it from the knowledge that we have in 2015, and you're projecting back 100 years, why weren't those people smarter back then? Well, the first textbook on wildlife management wasn't written until the 1930s. The United States of America had the very best people at the time with the knowledge of how to manage an area like this was quite limited, and no one was available who would staff these mythical trusts that could have done any better job than was done at the time. So you're taking what we know now in 2015, projecting back and condemning decisions that were made 100 years ago in light of the knowledge we have today. And your argument just falls totally flat. A, I'm not condemning the people, and I asserted that they had good intentions, that they had an experiment. I said that they were operating with the best of scientific knowledge that they had. I asserted that as far as I know, there was very little, if any, corruption that accounts for what turned out to be bad policies. But the question is... Chinese photographer and amateur club members want to come there. 
I'm sorry. sorry. If it's such a bad failure, a bad policy, why do 12 million Chinese amateur club photographers want to go there as their first choice? I mean, I, I, I am, I am celebrate. I am, I am celebrating Yellowstone as a success. I treasure Yellowstone. I've been in Yellowstone, I don't know, more than 50 times, less than 200, I'm sure. I mean, I don't know how many times. A lot of times. It's a great thing. I'm delighted we did it. But there's no question about it. But would it, was it perfect? Of course not. It was done with the best of scientific knowledge we had. As you said, we didn't have wildlife science until the 1920s or 30s. But they did the best they could. What, uh, so, and I'm saying, how would, pardon me? So who was around The question is, well, okay, let's, okay. We set up an institution, we set up an organization. Then the question is, we know, we absolutely know we're not going to get it perfectly correct. Then the question is, what set of organizations, what institutional structure will be most receptive to scientific information and have incentives to act on that information? There is absolutely no question that wildlife scientists knew, beginning in the 50s at least, or call it 1960 to be, to be safe, there were far too many elk in the park. There was no question about that. They all agreed. But there was so much political pressure against, exter or against killing the elk that they couldn't manage properly. So the, we, we're just going to get some stuff wrong when we set it up. It's, as I say, it's not stone tablets that come down from a, from a mountain by God. We're going to get it wrong. So the question is, what arrangements will encourage us, will enable us, to, take, to be receptive to new information, to the best scientific information, and turn it into policy for management? It's not going to be political, that's for sure. And you're going to watch, let me make a prediction. Uh, I predict that we're going to see really significant problems with bison. And they're almost all political. The park people basically know what to do, I think. They know that that landscape is being trampled by, an, by essentially an exotic species. Uh, you're doubting that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, then I, I never argue empirical matters. I mean, that's a, that's a matter of biological science, and I won't argue because you probably know more about it than I, but... The only limiting factor there was that the park boundary was drawn that excluded the winter rains, the historic winter rains of those species. There were not bison there originally. There was not a breeding population of bison there. And now we're politically constrained from managing it. It's everything, look. Right. <laughs> the park is wonderful. I'm so pleased we have it. I'm delighted I live where I live, and I hope we can preserve it. Given the pressures that are coming, the, my question is, or my task is, to, to suggest alternative management regimes that will enable us to take knowledge and apply it, insulated from political pressures, as best we can. It'll never be perfect insulation. But that's what I propose that we try to do. Anything else? No, I think that's good. And I think for students in thinking about your essays, um, we've heard some alternative viewpoints of, yeah, essentially what um, Dr. Baden just said, these alternative management regimes. And I would encourage you, because I know some folks are grappling with new economic terminology, to look beyond just the scope of national lands, but how these systems of management are used across the globe in a global context. And um, I'm only saying that because the, the students in the class have been relatively quiet as these debates have ensued, um, which I think means you're probably taking in a lot of information, which is great. <laughs> um, but, but look up the terms that might be confusing to you or might be new and um, and start there, and if you have any questions as you craft your essays, please feel free to email me, because I know a lot of information is needed for folks. Is this, is this glorious stuff or what? Thank you.
Well, I began by telling you the good feelings I had about Missoula, and that has only been reinforced, so thank you. <laughs>